Hello and welcome to the fourth panel in this Schiller Institute conference on the theme, Inspiring Humanity to Survive the Greatest Crisis in World History. I'm Jason Ross, here as the Science Advisor to the Schiller Institute, and I'm happy to be moderating this final panel entitled, The Art of Optimism, Using the Classical Principle to Change the World. We open with a musical demonstration of that classical principle, Leonora's gripping aria from Beethoven's only opera, Fidelio. In this story, based on the real-life imprisonment of the Marquis de Lafayette and the heroic actions of his wife to rescue him from prison, we hear Leonora, wife of the political prisoner Florestan, who dresses as a man to get a job in the prison where he is held. Under the assumed name of Fidelio, she gains the trust of the warden and plots how to use her access to save her husband. Just before the aria we're about to hear, Don Pizarro, the man who had imprisoned her husband Florestan for political reasons, demands that the prison warden kill a special prisoner, whom Leonora takes to be her husband. The warden refuses, and Don Pizarro announces that he will kill the prisoner himself. He commands the warden and Leonora, known as Fidelio, to enter the dungeon to dig the grave. Here now, Beethoven's aria in which Leonora reflects on Pizarro's evil and on the hope that sustains her. The aria is sung in Beethoven's original German with English subtitles. Thank you. 
Thank you to soprano Allison Spina and David Maiolo on piano, and thanks also to Nancy Geis for organizing that performance of Leonardo's, uh, Leonora's aria from Beethoven's opera Fidelio. This is The Art of Optimism, Using the Classical Principle to Change the World, the fourth panel of this two-day Schiller Institute conference. Now, on that theme, and on the role of LaRouche in that theme, uh, LaRouche addressed the division between science and art between German, perhaps, Naturwissenschaft and Geisteswissenschaft, between the techie and fuzzy domains, between the two cultures, as C.P. Snow called it. What is the relationship between science and classical art? Is science a realm of cold facts without human passion, but in which truth can be found? While art is a realm of emotions, where truth and beauty are purely in the eye of the beholder? No said LaRouche, there is a connection, and this connection has a bearing on the creation of the United States itself and on physical 
economics. Our first speaker, Dennis Speed of the Schiller Institute, will speak to us reportedly on the theme of Leibniz and America, the best of all possible revolutions. Dennis Speed. Okay, thank you, Jason. I'm going to start today with a quote from Cotton Mather, uh, one of the earliest of founding fathers. He wrote something in 1696 called Things for Distressed People to Think Upon. He said, there seems to be a shameful shrink of all sorts of men among us from that greatness and goodness which adorned our ancestors. We grow little in every way, little in our civil matters, little in our military matters, little in our ecclesiastical matters. We dwindle away to nothing. And that's what he thought in 1696. We are in an important revolutionary era. Schiller Institute founder Helga Sepp LaRouche many years ago ago, wrote a piece called A Revolution is a Question of Time. Two recent intersecting events, the September 8th death of Queen Elizabeth, the longest reigning monarch in English and British history, and the 100th birthday of her nemesis, physical economist Lyndon LaRouche, represent a true coincidence of opposites, the close and fall of one era of history and the opening and rise of another. In that coincidence of opposites is conjoined the true current and future history of the American Revolution. In the year that Elizabeth became queen, 1952, Lord Bertrand Russell, whom LaRouche once referred to as the most evil man of the 20th century, gave an interview reflecting on his 80th birthday. It's very difficult for anybody born since 1914 to realize how profoundly different the world is now from what it was when I was a child. The change has been almost unbelievable. I try as best I can, in spite of my years, to get used to living in a world of atom bombs, a world where ancient empires vanish like morning mist, where we have to accustom ourselves to Asiatic self-assertion. The world where I was young was a solid world, a world where all kinds of things that have now disappeared were thought to be going to last forever. It didn't dawn on people that they would cease Uh, English people certainly regarded English naval supremacy as a sort of law of nature. Britannia ruled the waves. It didn't occur to us that that might stop. Even with Bismarck? Uh, Bismarck was regarded as a rascal and uh, was thought of as a sort of uneducated farmer. But it was assumed that the influence of Goethe and Schiller would gradually bring Germany back to a more civilized point of view. Bertrand Russell's understanding of Friedrich Schiller and of Germany and of Bismarck is not shared by the Schiller Institute. It should be pointed out that Schiller admired the American Revolution. Bertrand Russell did not. Today, there exists the peculiar idea that the American Revolution was a product of bad British management of disputes with a section of its colonials. Lyndon LaRouche thought otherwise. In an essay entitled Leibniz and the List Hypothesis regarding the great German-American economist Friedrich List, LaRouche said, the death of England's Queen Anne marked the victory of a Venice-directed financier oligarchical faction of the Duke of Marlborough and Hanover's George Ludwig over England's patriots. In this circumstance, the defeated patriots turned their attention to the semi-autonomous colonies of North America viewing these colonies as the only hope for a future return of England, Scotland, and Ireland, each to its own patriotic cause. As the records show the historian, those English, Irish, and Scottish patriots typified by Jonathan Swift formed a joint international network which was headed by Germany's Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. The American Revolution was, in fact, a deliberate attempt to establish the political governmental conditions in which the science of physical economy, 
essentially invented by Gottfried Leibniz in his 1672 essay, Society and Economy, would become the basis of human progress. Monopoly is avoided since this society always desires to give commodities at their fair price, or even more cheaply in many cases, by causing manufactured goods to be produced locally rather than having them imported. It will especially preclude the formation of any monopoly of merchants or a cartel of artisans, along with any excessive accumulation of wealth by the merchants or excessive poverty of the artisans, which is particularly the case in Holland, where the majority of merchants are riding high, whereas the artisans are kept in continual poverty and toil. This is harmful to the Republic, since even Aristotle maintains that artisanship ought to be one of the worthiest occupations, for trade can carry only as much as the factories produce. And why, indeed, should so many people be poor and miserable for the benefit of such a small handful? After all, is not the entire purpose of society to release the artisan from his misery? Releasing the artisan, that is, the worker, from his misery, did not mean that people gave up working. Leibniz contended that the very opposite would happen. As labor, through technological progress, elevated work from repetitive, monotonous activity, people would work more precisely because they enjoyed being creative as well as productive. As for agriculture, Leibniz said, the farmer is not in need since he is sure of his bread and the merchant has more than enough. The remaining people are either destitute or government servants. Society can likewise satisfy all the farmer's own needs, provided it always buys from him at a reliably fair price, whether that be cheap or dear. We can thereby ensure for all eternity against natural food shortages, since society can then have what amounts to a general grain reserve. It was neither capitalism nor socialism nor any other ism that Leibniz sought to establish. The idea of advancing labor away from plantation slavery to manufacturers, what Alexander Hamilton would make in his 1790 report on manufacturers, the basis for consolidating America's revolution against Britain, was the opposite of what John Locke's Bank of England and Royal Africa Company would practice whatever words about liberty they preached. Leibniz's groundbreaking work on the steam engine and heat-powered machines meant that he and his collaborator Denis Papin anticipated the work of Robert Fulton and others by a hundred years. It's in part because of the mistaken idea that Locke inspired the American Constitution through writings like the Second Treatise of Government that the Leibnizian design for the best of all possible economies has not been dominant in the United States. Consider these words from 1672 and how far short we in the United States fall from this today. Through establishment of such a society, we eliminate a deep-seated drawback within many republics, which consists in allowing each and all to sustain themselves as they please, allowing one individual to become rich at the expense of a hundred others, or allowing him to collapse dragging down with him the hundreds who have put themselves under his care. An individual may or may not ruin his own family and then may or may not run through his, and his own and others' funds. Each country shall supply itself with those necessary commodities and manufactured goods which previously came from abroad so that it will not have to procure from others what it can have for itself. Each country shall be shown how properly to use its own domestic resources. In a country which has sufficient wool, manufacturing shall be established for the preparation of cloth. A country with an abundance of flax shall occupy its populace with the production of clothing, and so forth. And thus, no country among those which permit society the proper degree of freedom will be favored over the other. Rather, each shall be made to flourish in those areas in which God and nature have allowed it to excel. Although many know that John Locke's formulation of life, liberty, and property was rejected by Franklin, Adams, and even Thomas Jefferson in their writing of the Declaration of Independence in favor of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, most no longer know why. 
The founders explicitly rejected the outlook that Adam Smith put forward in his theory of the moral sentiments and of his later Wealth of Nations precisely because they understood Locke's, Leibniz's opposition to John Locke, who believed that happiness was, quote, the utmost pleasure we are capable of. Leibniz thought differently. I do not know whether the greatest pleasure is possible. I believe rather that it can grow ad infinitum. I believe then that happiness is a lasting pleasure, which cannot be so without there being a continual progress to new pleasures. Happiness is then, so to speak, a road through pleasures, and pleasure is merely a step in an advancement toward happiness, the shortest which can be made according to the present impressions, but not always the best. The right road may be missed in the desire to follow the shortest, as the stone which goes straight may encounter obstacles too soon, which prevent it from advancing quite to the center of the earth. This shows us that it is the reason and the will which transport us toward happiness, but that feeling and desire merely lead us to pleasure. True happiness ought always to be the object of our desires, but there is ground for doubting whether it is. For often we hardly think of it, and I have remarked here more than once that the less desire is guided by reason, the more it tends to present pleasure and not to happiness, that is to say, to lasting pleasure. Leibniz was the greatest scientific thinker of his age. He was the inventor of the calculus in 1676 at the age of 30. His work on binary numbers anticipated the modern computer. We've already mentioned his collaboration on advancing the steam engine, but Leibniz was also a master organizer. He finally met with Russia's Peter the Great shortly before his death in 1716, that is Leibniz's death. But 19 years before that uh, meeting, Leibniz had expressed his great interest in working with Peter and Russia to discover whether there was a land bridge connecting the American continent to Asia. Author Christina Kunzowit writes, the 52-year-old German Protestant scientist was fascinated by the idea of a young czar traveling incognito through half of Europe. Leibniz tried hard to establish contact with Peter, but could only do so through Francois Lefort, the Tsar's influential old friend. A fixed point in Leibniz's ideas was the question of whether there was a land bridge between Asia and America. As early as 1697, he sent a detailed plan about his ideas to Lefort in order to have them presented to the Tsar. He wrote, to make the maps, we must send engineers, observe the high points, longitudes, and variations of the compass, and determine the coasts, especially in the Northeast, as much as we can, to learn if Asia is joined to America or if we can pass between them. In their meeting in 1716, Leibniz presented Peter with a plan for a system of educational institutions devoted to teaching the sciences to all people, but he also proposed how those institutions would help organize the state. Peter's Russian Academy of Sciences was founded in 1724. Leibniz's interest in and respect for China has been well documented. As he said, I consider it a singular plan of the fates that human civilization and refinement should today be concentrated, as it were, in the two extremes of our continent, in Europe and in China, which adorns the Orient as Europe does the opposite edge of the earth. Perhaps supreme providence has ordained such an arrangement so that as the most cultivated and distant peoples stretch out their arms to each other, those in between may gradually be brought to a better way of life. As for his work in England, which was not exactly uh, consummated, it is best to read the work by historian Graham Lowry, How the Nation Was Won. Graham tells us, as early as 1670, while serving the Elector of Mainz and in touch with the French nation-building forces associated with uh, Mazarin and later Colbert, Leibniz proposed a grand design for a harmon harmonia universalis, a universal harmony of sovereign republics, which included a crucial role for America. Although historians have generally sought to minimize Leibniz's significance and virtually obliterate his importance to America, he was no stranger to New England leaders. Among his correspondents was John Winthrop Jr., the leading American astronomer, physicist, and industrial entrepreneur of his day. 
As governor of Connecticut, Winthrop secured for it the virtually sovereign status his father, John Winthrop, had established for the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And uh, I should also add that uh, John Winthrop Jr. was also the head of Harvard College uh, for 20 years, uh, from 1661 to 1681, I believe. In England itself, a pro-Republican faction had grouped itself around the then reigning Queen Anne. England and France were then involved in a fratricidal war draining both nations. A raid against those Republican forces, such as Robert Harley, the chief minister to Queen Anne, were John Locke, Isaac Newton, and the newly created Bank of England, a private entity that came into existence in 1694, and by the way, was private until 1946. To counter the Bank of England, Harley's faction had proposed legislation to limit the bank interest rates to 4%, to establish uh, a Bank of Public Accounts Commission of the House of Commons to investigate corrupt practices of the City of London, and the creation of a national land bank, which was to be a source of low-cost credit for improving farming. They also published uh, Daniel Defoe's Essays Upon Several Projects, which proposed that the bank itself be placed under public authority. Uh, all of those uh, measures were rejected, uh, and uh, then the Republicans of England looked to Leibniz. Now, partially with the assistance of Leibniz, that faction nearly pulled off a coup, which would have meant that Leibniz would have become a decisive presence, presence in England and perhaps prime minister. Uh, through a change in what was called the Act of Settlement in 1701, uh, the re English Republicans sought to install Hanover's Prince Sophie on the throne of England uh, and were successful in having the actual Act of Settlement read such that Hanover was, in fact, ultimately placed on the throne, but not Sophie. This would have meant, meant, uh, meant that, together with Leibniz's own scientific work, it would have made Leibniz and his pro-development faction hegemonic, but it did not work. Before she could come to power, Sophie died in June of 1714. Anne died in August, and Sophie's brother Ludwig came to power, effectively a much different entity, effectively ending these prospects. It would be the supporters of Leibniz in America, including Philadelphia's James Logan and later Benjamin Franklin, that would carry forward his grand design. That would be in the form of the American Revolution of 1776. So Leibniz did not win the battle for his world of universal harmony in his lifetime. So why did Leibniz believe that this is the best of all possible worlds? An idea that is often satirized, as it was by Voltaire and later by Leonard Bernstein in his opera Candide. Why did he believe that the universe itself had a moral arc and that the discovery of the universe's laws by humanity provided the greatest of human pleasures? In the last two months, as a result of the imaged transmissions received on Earth from the James Webb Telescope, our fundamental ideas about the origin, composition, and even destiny of the universe have been shaken, even including the sacred idea of the Big Bang. The image of the universe is a big pot stuck around and far above one's head, with stars and galaxies gleaming in one location or another, is shattered. The Pothead's Guide to the Galaxy, Euclidean space-time, up, down, right, left, forward, backward, and it also, as well as mere non-Euclidean space-time, can no longer be said to map the real universe in, that, in which we actually live. The very immensity of the universe now known to exist, just under 100 years after the American astronomer Edwin Hubble demonstrated that the Milky Way was just one of many galaxies, was discussed in a June 22nd article on the site BigThink.com, and it stated, Our most detailed observations of the distance universe from the Hubble Extreme Deep Field give us an estimate of 170 billion galaxies, a theoretical calculation from a few years ago, the first to account for galaxies too small, faint, and distant to be seen, put the estimate far higher, at 2 trillion. But even that estimate is too low. There ought to be at least 6 trillion and perhaps more like 20 trillion galaxies if we're ever able to count them all. Our Milky Way, which contains the, uh, well, the, the, the immensity of the universe, though, is still smaller than the size of the human mind. Why? 
Because the mind contains the universe itself as an idea. Because the mind has no size me measurement uh, as such, the mind is not the same as the brain, which is of a definite physical size, weight, and shape. The mind is metaphysical. It has no place as such, but has its center everywhere and its circumference nowhere. The mind has boundaries, but it is without limit. If, as one thinker has said, the universe is a thought of God, then consider these words of Albert Einstein. I want to know how God created this world. I'm not interested in this or that phenomenon and the spectrum of this or that element. I want to know God's thoughts. The rest are details. That was the outlook that Gottfried Leibniz and his American collaborators and fellow discoverers brought to lawful political practice in his time for all people. His was the best of all possible revolutions and best of all possible worlds because of his commitment to permanent creativity, which can only become a greater pleasure because more, and in fact, all of humanity is called upon to participate in it. Hmm. Thank you very much, Dennis Speed. Uh, you have questions for Dennis and for the other speakers that we'll be hearing from on our panel, please send them in to us, questions at schillerinstitute.org. Our next speaker is Megan Dobrot, the president of the U.S. Schiller Institute, and she will be speaking on LaRouche's Principle of the Human Mind, Kepler and Our Harmonic Universe. Megan Dobrot. The human mind is the most powerful phenomenon in the universe that we're aware of. This fact was Lyndon LaRouche's specialty, and it's what all science and art must learn from him today. It lay at the root of his early discovery in the science of physical economy, and it's something which he continued to develop deeper and deeper insight into over the course of his life. In 2014, LaRouche pointed out in response to breakthroughs in fusion and plasma physics that the human species was beginning to surpass the sun in terms of the levels of energy flux density and the states of matter under our control. The great miracle at the root of all of this is that human thoughts, conceptions, which originate not from experience, not from observation, not from the outside, so to speak, but only as inventions of the imagination of a single human being correspond so closely to the principles running the universe outside of our skins that when we act on those thoughts, we gain new and great powers in and over that universe. The category of such thoughts that are successful in that respect, we call scientific discoveries. And they are the root of the distinction of mankind from all other species on earth. And they're the root of our progress away from an animal-like existence toward one which is capable of leaving this planet and establishing life and cognitive life on other planetary bodies. This fact, this miracle, challenges what is often believed to be the boundary between the human mind and the universe, a false separation between man and nature. And it raises the issue of what role we as a species have been assigned to play, should we accept the mission, in the continuing self-development of our universe. This brings before us as our proper subject, the driver of all progress, human and otherwise, the creative imagination, which moves us out of the domain of logic, of mathematics and other such things, and into the domain of art. Specifically here today, what I want to address is the subject of harmony, not just sensible harmonies, but the principle of harmony, the mind's ability to discover, you might say invent, a higher unifying one that governs 
and tunes the multiplicity. Why is this so important today? Among other reasons, human beings have reached the point in our development where we are no longer earthlings. Not only do we travel physically off of the surface of the planet regularly to the International Space Station, and hopefully again soon to the moon, through non-human explorers, like the Voyager missions, the Curiosity and Perseverance rovers on Mars, the, the Chinese rover on the far side of the moon, we have extended our sensorium and implicitly our power to act to the surfaces of other worlds. The most recent example, which has captured the imagination of many, is the work of the James Webb Space Telescope, which has given us the deep infrared eyes needed to see and map previously unseen phenomena, many of which already are beginning to challenge the basic assumptions about the principles behind the larger galactic and intergalactic systems in which our humble little Earth swims. What is the principle running this galaxy, this intergalactic system, as a system, as a one? To even begin to answer that question, scientists today must take their orientation from the work of Johannes Kepler, from his discovery of the principle animating our solar system, to which Lyndon LaRouche pointed again and again. It's here that we find a powerful example of the mode of creative thought necessary to make the breakthroughs of principle that we need today, as opposed to the kinds of mere modeling of appearances, which Kepler overturned hundreds of years ago. In 1609, Kepler published a revolutionary work called the New Astronomy. In this work, he refounds the science of astronomy, lifting it out of the realm of a geometric modeling of appearances and placing it firmly in the domain of physics. In that work, Kepler walks the reader through each step of his discovery that the planets are moved by the physical power of the sun. The result of that, the, the outcome of that, is that the planets trace out orbits which are elliptical rather than being perfectly circular. After that work, Kepler returns to the higher question, one which he tackled preliminarily as a young teacher in his early 20s. What makes the individual planets and the sun a system, a universe? as opposed to a collection of things which just happen to be in the same part of space. Another way of posing that question is, why and how did God shape the solar system this way rather than otherwise? It's here that Kepler turns to music, to harmony. Kepler wasn't the first to look at the nighttime sky with a feeling that there was a harmony to its motions. This is a quite ancient idea, which we see signs of in Plato's Timaeus dialogue. The breakthrough, Kepler's breakthrough, was in leaving behind the idea that the sense perceptible harmony or the numerical harmony was primary. He leaps to a higher generating principle an entity which can only be heard by the ears of the mind. Let's take a simple illustration. Here you see the notes of the musical scale, the major scale. Above the notes, you see numbers. So let me show you what those numbers mean. It was known millennia ago that the tones of what we today call the major and minor scales can be built from a number of whole number ratios. For example, if we have a simple vibrating string, a string stretched across a resonating box like a cello or violin, the string will make a tone when plucked. So let's call the length of the string one. Now, if I mark off, measure and mark off two thirds of the string, 
I now have a shorter part, which is in a ratio of two to three with the whole string. And its motion, when plucked, is in a ratio of three to two with the whole. Now, when I pluck that shorter string, I get a tone which is higher than that of the original. But when, when, when played against it, with it, it sounds beautiful, consonant. The two tones are in harmony. The same holds for the division of the string at three fourths, four fifths, five sixths, five eighths, and three fifths. You can hear that here. From these proportions and proportions of these proportions, we generate all of the tones of the major and minor musical scales. But here already a problem arises. Let me illustrate it as follows. Take an instrument like a piano. The strings of a piano must be tuned to specific fixed pitches. So, Let's say we're tuning the piano centered on the scale or the note of G, as Kepler did. A minor third in the scale up from G is the note B flat. That's a five sixth ratio with the whole. A fifth up from that is a two thirds ratio and brings us to the note F. Great. So two thirds of five sixths is five ninths of the original string. So we tune our note F to five ninths. Now, say that I want the tuner to check his or her work. I know that the same note F is a fifth or two thirds ratio down from the note C above. That C is a three eighths ratio to the original G. However, three eighths, or rather, two thirds down from three eighths is not five ninths, it's nine sixteenths. That's a small but audible difference. So which value for F is correct? Five ninths, nine sixteenths? Do we choose something halfway in between? Thereby ruining or, or um, losing the perfect harmonic quality of the two thirds ratio. The issue here is that this example is not an isolated case. The harmonic system, the musical system is riddled with such disagreements and there is no possible mathematical calculation which can resolve those disagreements and keep the pure whole number intervals. It's impossible. What that means practically is that depending on which note or which scale you choose to start your melody on, uh, you could get a real unpleasant out of tuneness. Now, this problem, an issue called musical tempering, is something which Kepler intensely studied. He was very interested in it. Now, this problem, an issue called musical tempering is something which Kepler was intensely interested in and one which he spent a good amount of time studying. Why is this significant? Because of where its solution lies. Kepler lived at a time when the discovery of musical polyphony was beginning to emerge. As opposed to a single principal melody line with the other voices or instruments merely accompanying, supporting, or in service of that line. In polyphony, we have many independent voices, each singing a different melody, and yet coming together into a unified, beautiful one, into a harmony 
which is a higher type of harmony than the simple one of two consonant tones. The most advanced modern expressions of this can be heard in the fugues of J.S. Bach, the symphonies of Mozart, and the string quartets of Beethoven. As with a living process, in complex polyphonic music, the intervals and the notes are not fixed. The musicians, string players or singers, for example, will make slight adjustments to the tuning of the notes in the moment, such that each note of his or her independent line is very slightly altered to tune to the changing and developing harmonies of the whole composition. The individual intervals are no longer pure because their values are adjusted, tempered to the higher one. Polyphony fascinated Kepler. It truly gripped him as a modern discovery beyond the capability of the ancients, which had given us more advanced harmonics than those of simple numbers. With polyphonic music perhaps filling his mind, Kepler was convinced that a higher, much more complex kind of harmony could be applied to the issue not of the motions of musical instruments, but of the planets of the solar system. In considering why the planets of our solar system move in the particular orbits that they do, and at the specific distances at which they lie, and not otherwise, Kepler's work brought him to a point at which he could say, he knew, that to an observer standing on the sun, or if you will, to the sun itself, looking out at the moving planets, the fastest and slowest motions of each planet, in other words, those that bound the orbit, have ratios to one another and to each other across planets that correspond to the notes of the major and minor musical scales. In this image, you can see the planets highlighted in pink. And on the left, we see harmonic proportions indicated between motions of planets. And on the right, we see harmonic intervals between the fastest and slowest motion of each planet tuning to itself. The problem is that these harmonies of the planets, they're not perfect. There are small and sometimes not so small errors, discrepancies between the perfect whole number ratios and the data from the planets. Now, a mathematician might say, and many mathematicians have said, see, Kepler was wrong. It was a nice, sweet idea, but it's not true. Now, what Kepler knew is that these discrepancies of the planetary harmonies from the whole number ratios were not errors, but instead they were reflective of the tempered harmonies of a polyphonic system. Kepler put the data to one side. In his imagination, as if he were composing the solar system, Kepler conceived of a tuning, a tempering, in which each planet's motion would be in harmony not just with itself, not just with its immediate neighbors, but with the greatest number of other motions at once, as if each planet were a member of a multi-voiced cosmic chorus. In this way, the perfect harmony of each individual ratio was sacrificed for the higher perfection of the unity of the whole, of the motions of all. Here's Kepler. It is the universal harmony of all which chiefly makes the world perfect, rather than the individual twinnings of neighboring pairs. For harmony is a certain relationship of unity. Therefore, they are united if they are all at one at the same time, rather than if each pair separately agree in pairs of harmonies. So that in a conflict between the two, one or other of pairs of harmonies of the pairs of planets must have yielded, 
so that the universal harmonies of all could stand. And in completing his notion of the power, the physical power of the sun, Kepler writes, not only does light go out to the whole world from the sun, as from the focus or eye of the world, as all life and heat does from the heart, all motion from the ruler and mover, but in return, there are collected at the sun from the whole cosmic province by royal right, these, so to speak, repayments of the most desirable harmony, or rather images of the pairs of motions flowing to it are linked together into a single harmony by the working out of some mind. Just as a great conductor takes control, you might say, over the members of an orchestra, animating them, unifying their individual motions into a single harmonic entity, so does the sun guide and animate the motions of the planets into a higher one. With that thought, come back to our galaxy and beyond. For Kepler, his principle was universal. It held through the extent of the known universe, the planets up through Saturn. Now, as a side note, Kepler knew that there was more to it. Not only did he forecast the existence of the asteroid belt as a result of the particular harmonies between Mars and Jupiter, he was also interested in working on the problem of the secular changes of the orbits. In other words, Kepler was aware that the eccentricities of the orbits were not fixed, but they, and therefore the planet's motions, changed over long periods of time. And Kepler planned to dig into those causes. How were the harmonies changing over time? He unfortunately died before he could do that work. Now, at Kepler's time, the planets beyond Saturn were unknown. The asteroid and Kuiper belts were unknown. The fact that our star is one within a galaxy of billions of stars, each orbiting a galactic center, was unknown. That our galaxy is one of trillions, each with billions of stars, most of those stars with planetary systems around them, was not an available field for Kepler to think upon. That is left to us. If we simply extend Kepler's harmonic system even to the outer planets of our solar system, it doesn't work. Not in terms of the simple harmonies or even simply tempered harmonies. There are dissonances. What's the cause of those dissonances? With NASA's telescope named, fittingly, I think, named Kepler, along with Hubble, the Spitzer Telescope, and others, we have managed to detect 5,157 confirmed exoplanets, planets orbiting stars outside of our solar system. These 5,000 and some exoplanets are contained in 3,804 planetary systems. This is just scratching the surface and it's mind blowing. With the James Webb Space Telescope, we've recently demonstrated a greatly improved capability to study these exoplanets. Webb recently imaged an exoplanet about 385 light years from Earth. And this image is a feat that's been compared to taking a picture of a firefly against the backdrop of a searchlight. So with Webb, we can not only detect the periodicity of the orbit, how often it circles its star, but also the temperature of its atmosphere. There's another interesting solar system, which Webb will study over the course of the next year called the TRAPPIST-1 system, which is a relatively close star system about 40 light years away. This star system has seven Earth-sized planets orbiting its star, and three or maybe four of these are believed to be at a distance that would allow liquid water to exist there. Now, 
One of the fascinating things about this system is that the period of each planet's orbit, how long it takes to circle its star, is in a harmonic ratio with that of its immediate neighbors. So the length of one planet's year is in a five to eight ratio with that of the next, which is in a three to five ratio with that of the next, and so on. So these observations are very preliminary, but they're completely fascinating in terms of what further study of star systems and planetary systems like this could show us. Perhaps one element of solving the larger galactic question will be to study the tempering, not just of one set of planetary motions, but a galaxy full of them. What discrepancies or commas could we discover that might allow us, as a musician does, to begin to imagine the larger galactic one, which is responsible for tuning this multiplicity? All discovery occurs from the top down, not the bottom up. Another way to say that is that you cannot build this universe up from a point. You can only derive it from an idea. The painstaking and technologically incredible observations of the phenomena out there, as with the Webb telescope, the thousands and thousands of hours of processing reprocessing, working the data into a meaningful form, these are all the great and absolutely necessary work in service of the scientific imagination. That is the only power capable of taking those unveiled paradoxes in the data and inventing the higher unseeable one, a creative godlike thought that generated them. That is science, as I've learned it from Lyndon LaRouche, as science has been educated by art and as science must be taken up by those looking toward the heavens today. Let's end with Lyndon LaRouche. Man's development and the whole social process of man's development is a creative process. Mankind is intrinsically, by nature, a creative entity, a self-creative entity. Now, man dies, but that doesn't end the process, because actually, the existence of the human being is implicitly universal. The human individual is a universal thing, which lives in history, and only realizes itself when it's living in history. And history lies always in a higher power, which we call the future. It's the higher development of the higher process, the self-development of the universe. And man is a participant by resonance with that progress in the universe. And therein lies the source of the power of mankind as a species. Thank you, Megan DeBroat, for that tour of the human mind and the universe. Again, questions. Send your questions into questions at schillerinstitute.org. We'll be hearing from two more speakers, and then we will turn to your questions. Next, our third speaker is Jacques Cheminat. He is the president of the French political party Solidarité et Progrès, and he was three times candidate for the president of France. He speaks to us today on his topic, Optimism to Recover from Our Mortal Illness. Jacques Cheminade. Optimism to recover from a mortal illness. Enthusiasm. Love of beauty. Sublime blossoming of great souls. These are two verses, two short verses, of Lazare Carnot's Ode to Enthusiasm. Carnot was a key figure of the French Revolution, known as the organizer of the victory. He defeated the coalition of all European feudal regimes against the revolution. 
but he was more, more, much more than a general. It was he who inspired the Ecole Polytechnique, which later became the model for the American West Point Academy. He was also the first scientist to coin the term physical economy. Beyond that, he wrote poems, such as this ode, to celebrate the creative powers of human beings, of human beings acting for the common good. I'm starting my speech with this. First, because enthusiasm is the highest expression of human optimism. Second, because his poems refer explicitly to Friedrich Schiller. And third, because Lyndon LaRouche always mentioned him as a homo universalis, an explorer of all fields of knowledge, exploring to ensure the advantage of the other. He reached the top of glory during his lifetime after fighting both the internal and external enemies of the revolution, the bloodthirsty barbarians at the French convention, for example, and was finally thrown out of France and exiled to Magdeburg, Germany. Despite the lack of recognition from his own compatriots, he never complained and fought for his ideas until the last moments of his life, always enthusiastically optimistic, hoping always for the best to happen. His commitment is a secret behind relentlessly, relentless optimism, the sublime blossoming emerging in a great soul. The word enthusiasm comes from the ancient Greek inteo, which means the inner God potentially located in each of us. It demands from us to look at the universe in resonance with the best inside ourselves, to look at our capacity to create in resonance with a continuously created universe. It teaches us to be inner directed by our commitment to the highest causes and not other directed by the deadly rumors of public opinion. Look at John Sebastian Bach's Jesu meine Freude. It's pure enthusiastic optimism, joy, joy at the birth of Christ as a potential for the good and the beautiful. And Bach adds, may my joy endure, a commitment to keep that joy alive, even among the worst pains and the worst dangers. It is hope, hope in the sense of true optimism. It is also one of the three theological virtues in Christianity, along with love and faith. It takes different forms in the main theological and moral moments of human creation. Pratidi or Apeksh in Hinduism or in Confucius words Education breeds confidence, confidence breeds hope, and hope breeds peace. Why is what I'm trying to convey, to convey to you, so key today? Because what you hear everywhere in our Western nations, in the midst, in the midst of this potentially deadly crisis for humanity, is nothing but different shades of pessimism. They are too powerful. You can't challenge them. I'm just a second fiddle. Can't you mobilize somebody else? What you are saying sounds good, but too good to become true, etc., etc., and etc. Such pessimism is deadly. It leads to abstention or to impotent rage. This is the true tragedy of our times. When a mobilization is needed to save our nations and humanity, to awaken our people with a program for security and development for all nations. When opportunity to react is opening up now because the crimes of the oligarchy are impacting our own and others' private lives, pessimism becomes then 
our worst enemy. And those who are conscious of the problem, conscious of the problem, as they themselves say, and do little or nothing, must be called either enemies or prostitutes. Why so? If you do nothing to save others, if you are not optimistic, you refuse to be human, you indulge the sleep of reason which has already produced monsters. Look at Liz Truss, or better power speech at Jackson Hole. Look at Volodymyr Zelensky and Joe Biden. Look at Emmanuel Macron, who is a life in death algorithm. Look at them. And look at those who pessimistically comment and do nothing against them. They become part of the crowd. Clowns in a slaughterhouse. Pessimism is a crime against humanity and against your own soul. Because if you are pessimistic, you don't think. You have given up your creative powers. Then you side against the principle of reason, the principle of creation. You become a beast worse than any of them. You take things for granted a pathway to the graveyard of humanity. So let's not go there. It stinks. Let's instead give to our nation, to our society, and to humanity as a whole, a share of immortality, as Lyndon LaRouche did, to be freely in resonance with the laws of the universe. Freedom is to discover new principles, which are the newborn babies of the mind, to inspire the sublime, to confront the worse, and win. Sure, the cynics will say, but Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and John Kennedy were murdered. Julian Assange and Lyndon LaRouche were thrown in jail. Well, all of them, in their own way, have been human and reached that share of immortality, even if, as Arouche said, they have to physically drink the cup of Gexman, Gexemani. Sometimes your life or your physical, physical freedom are the price to pay to be human. They all share a higher purpose, and the present state of the world, the threat to see all beautiful things that humanity has created disappear, either through a nuclear war or an economic chaos, or both, likely, most likely both, compels us to act in the image of those heroes. In that sense, Lyndon LaRouche has been the Prometheus of our two centuries. This is not something which, as they say in France, which should inflate our sneakers, but a responsibility to pay off a moral debt to future generations incurred by the past ones. Our long history of courageous women and men and creative geniuses this is what it's at stake with being optimistic or pessimistic. The question is, will we take sides with Zeus or with Prometheus? Those powers lies in his Pandora box, full of plagues, diseases, greed, envy, anger, and hatred for human beings, whose creativity he fears as a threat to his own system of power. His policy is to divide and conquer through an indefinite narrative of family feuds. It is the same with the financial oligarchy imperialists, which perceives the development of China, a China having put an end to poverty, as a threat. Prometheus is not what the greenies of our times somehow believe. Power for the sake of power, of the universe, 
against the rule of Zeus. His power lies not in a show of force, but in the principle of creation of the potential of fire. Not for himself, but for future human beings who do not need fear fire. Human beings do not fear fire and shall use it to act creatively upon the universe, grow and multiply. Prometheus does not fear sharing his power with human beings as a meaningful principle of participation to the process of creation as properly and beautifully expressed in Achilles' Prometheus. True, Zeus' ego in the Greek black legend is bound to eat forever the liver of bounded Prometheus. But is it not our task to unbound his principle inside our minds and to act now accordingly? If we are pessimistic, we tend to be submerged by the virtual reality of screens and accept the euthanasia of imagination. We fall into the trap of the oligarchy, images and money, images and money, perception, frustration and addiction. Lyndon LaRouche denounced the sex drug counterculture and now we are in the middle of it. The pessimistic escape from reality inflicted upon their children by the boomers and post-boomers, mothers and fathers. Optimism is to escape from the prison of an, addict, of an addictive society, our mortal society, based on the greed for money and lust for images, which makes us believe, which make you believe that you are an individual, while in reality, both your mind and your savings are occupied territories. So let's stop thinking that man is a wolf for man. If not, we'll become ourselves wolves. Pessimism is intrinsically an evil sickness. Hope, optimism are the key to recovery, both for an individual and for society as a whole and our society is mortally sick. From the standpoint of economics, the remedy is a new Bretton Woods benefiting all nations, La Rouche's new Bretton Woods. In that sense, the joint declaration of Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin on February 4 is the best approximation of a door open towards our common future. Compare it to the racist rejection of anything Russian or Chinese or belonging to the best of their cultures by the fringe of Western elites associated with the black sons of our times. The black sons of our times whose morbid nefarious light shines well beyond the borders of Ukraine. Of course, a world land bridge as a mental and physical metaphor for all humanity demands much more. It is what Scott Ritter and others demanded recently to act as one body to strike back politically at our enemies. This includes unleashing, this also includes unleashing a wave of laughter, of laughter against them. Because laughter is not only a beautiful revenge against undue respect for them. Rebellion laughter is unique to free ourselves, to free women and men. To change our way of thinking is therefore our immediate challenge in order to avoid any setbacks or suicidal mistakes and fulfill our mission. Let our joy remain and have fun. 
Thank you very much, uh, Jacques Cheminat. Uh, again, our period for questions will be coming soon after our, our final speaker. Send in your questions and reflections to us at questions at schillerinstitute.org. Our final speaker on this panel is Anastasia Battle, the editor of the Schiller Institute magazine, Leonora. Her talk is titled Beyond Ideology. Take it away, Anastasia. Hi, this is Anastasia Battle of Leonora Magazine. Uh, this is Schiller Institute's uh, cultural magazine. And I'd like to thank you for joining us on this really wonderful occasion to celebrate Lyndon LaRouche's 100th birthday. Uh, I have to say it's really an honor to live in this time period when we have the potential for the greatest change in human history. Uh, I, I really want um, you to take, a take some time to look back at all the different panels uh, that we worked through together and think about what this weekend really means, what this represents. You are now part of a historical process to upshift humanity. The next question you might ask me is, well, how on earth are we gonna do that? <laughs> That's what we're gonna talk about. I, I bet that everybody here has at some point or another tried to talk to another person about the different ideas that we've presented here today. Maybe you worked on something, something was very exciting, or maybe you've gone out and you've done some organizing or you've gone to your congressman, something like that. Do all the conversation always, do all the conversations always go smoothly? I mean, sometimes it just really seems like the people you're talking to are stuck, doesn't it? If they just won't let go of a thought, they might even get upset, call you some names. Uh, they seem to go around in circles with you and they might even get a little bit violent. What you just experienced was an ideological wall. Now, what we specialize in as a whole movement is not only our ability to identify an ideology, but successfully working people through it to discover what's truthful. Mr. LaRouche, <clears throat> Mr. LaRouche called this the polemical method. Now, in order to get to this, you have to be free in your own mind in order to use irony and metaphor to successfully break someone else free of their ideology. Otherwise, you're just fighting with each other's ideologies. You might as well just be bringing sticks out. <clears throat> so where does that come from? How, do, how are you able to break through your own ideology so you can help others? Classical composition, classical culture. I'm gonna read you a quote from Friedrich Schiller. It's from his essay uh, called, Theater Considered as a Moral Institution. Just so it can give you an insight into what I'm talking about. He says, the theater sheds light not only on man and his character, but also on his destiny and teaches us the great art of facing it bravely. In the fabric of our lives, chance and design play equally important roles. The latter is directed by us while we must blindly submit to the former. We have already come a long way if the inevitable does not catch us wholly unprepared. If our courage and resourcefulness have already been tested by similar events and our heart has been hardened for its blow. The stage brings before us a rich array of human woes. It artfully involves us in the troubles of others and rewards us for this momentary pain with tears of delight and a splendid increase in our courage and experience. Now ask yourself, is that the quality of mind that a culture of Lady Gaga, Romstein, and yes, even Jimi Hendrix gives you? 
Some people think that when you talk about classical culture, we mean that you have to wear old timey clothes. You might talk with a British accent and you only listen to orchestral music. That's not what we're talking about. In fact, you might just be British, if <laughs> a British oligarch, if that's, if that's your idea of classical culture. <clears throat> that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is a method of thinking. This is the method in which you can access the creative faculties of your mind, which human disco discovery being what it is, can be used to help others access their own through your insight. This method can be applied to every aspect of your life, any subject, art, science, politics. I want to challenge you, the viewer, to take this in seriously. This is not a matter of taste or preference of style. And if we're being honest here, you didn't even choose popular culture to begin with. It was chosen for you. These are not your own preferences. You probably have run into these kind of lines before, but when I'm talking to people, you know, out in the streets or, I mean, geez, even just on social media now, on TikTok, they're talking about this kind of stuff, popular psychology. But people are perfect just the way they are. You shouldn't change them. I mean, honestly, can we look around the state of the world and say people are actually perfect just the way they are? I'm not bringing this up because I think we should run around and try to break people down and get someone to submit, just to give up everything and submit to a certain, you know, a new ideology or something. But if enough creative individuals come together like we're doing here today to create polemics, collaborate on classical composition in music, art, poetry, find a breakthrough historical outlook, discover a scientific principle, this will be the difference in us winning. We could inspire whole generations after us into a new renaissance. That's where we are right now in world history. That's what can happen. There are no other options at this point. There aren't some secret uh, arsenal of trickery that our politicians can tap into and think that they can pull one over and, and try to save the system. It's just not going to keep going. It can't. This is what we have to do. I want you to join in this mission. It's a lot of fun. Uh, work with the Leonora, work with the Schiller Institute. Please write. I want to encourage more people to write, get active, paint, read great works, write great works. Find that polemic in an ideology in your country, in your culture. I mean, this could mean the fundamental breakthrough, not just for you, but for your whole society around you to understand how they can make a new upshift. I'm going to put some contact information in the chat. Um, but please interact with us, get active with us, mobilize with us, and let's have a lot of fun being human while we do it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you to Anastasia, uh, our final speaker on the panel. So what we'll do is we'll bring up the uh, panelists that we have available for the discussion period. I believe we have everybody here. Uh, or will. So we got Dennis, Anastasia, Megan, Jacques. Good. Um, hello, everyone. So let's we'll jump right in. We have a question or comment, um, a response from Carolina Dominguez in Mexico. She is the coordinator of the LaRouche Youth Movement uh, in Ibero-America. So Carolina will, I believe, speak in Spanish and we'll have um, you know, live interpretation. So please, Carolina. Hola, buenas tardes. 
Yes. Hello, good afternoon. My question is a little bit of a commentary as well on the work which we're carrying out here in the universities with our campaign, the initiative that's called LaRouche in the Universities. Although we've expanded this to LaRouche in the universities, the institutions, in the streets, and everywhere. Now, this initiative came about uh, <clears throat> if, because if we were really doing what's correct in the field of education, we wouldn't be facing this kind of a systemic crisis. Part of the briefing that I want to give you about the universities and how we're carrying out this work with youth, which we're also doing in the streets with the population in general, is that there's a there's a perspective, as Jacques was saying, there's a problem of pessimism, which isn't intrinsic to the individual, but it's rather generated by the educational process. I have questions which are not only mine, but I also want to be the spokeswoman for a number of the questions which have come up in our work in studying physical economy. And one of those questions is, has to do with classical art. Every Tuesday we read Shakespeare. We've read Coriolan Coriolanus. We've read where Shakespeare gives a, like a class of what economics is. We're, we're reading, and my question is, what is the objective of classical art, if it is a question of locating the evil of various individuals and to be very clear about that and get it rid of, rid of it, or to rather locate the tragedy of the individual that allows that evil to become part of him or participate and be part of that evil, like Iago's evil vis-a-vis -vis Othello. This is a question which always comes up in our dialogues, in our reading of Shakespeare because the idea of just identifying evil and distancing oneself from it is somehow going to avoid a tragedy. So I especially want to ask Jacques uh, about this because we haven't been able to resolve this issue. Uh, we've discussed it for quite some time. And another question which I have also for Megan is we're organizing in the universities in the streets for quite some time. And my, my view is that the Kepler work, the uh, work on reproducing those ideas can save you a whole lot of useless discussion of people with sophistry and whether things are bad or they're good. And this allows the mind of the individual to access a process of kind of dropping, dropping their defenses and say, okay, fine, I just don't know and then to be willing to learn what has been correct in economics. And my question on this is, how do we achieve in the sense of Kepler, how do we get rid of this fear of not understanding or reaching any conclusion, perhaps as you uh, study Kepler, but not identify that proper paradox, which is needed to solve a problem or are all paradoxes correct? So those are questions which I'm uh, transmitting to you from the work that we're carrying out in organizing on the streets. And I also want to ask a question and take advantage of this uh, opportunity. I want to know about from Anastasia, the impact that the magazine Leonora has had among youth. Are people reading it? Is there some interest in this? How have you brought this about? Is this is being taken out in the streets to the population in general? I'd like to know what the impact is and what your reading is on how people are responding to these kinds of documents that are important for educating individuals. And, and for Dennis, I have a question uh, si since I've got this opportunity, I, uh, again, as a spokesman for others, on the question of Leibniz, we work we've done on Leibniz. We've had various uh, workshops on Leibniz. It's, this is impressive. This is what's most inspired us to, to 
carry out this work, uh, Leibniz and also classes that we had with Dennis Small. And Leibniz was very clear that we had to have a new economy, a physical economy. Leibniz was really clear on the need to educate the next generations to be able to do that. How do we do that? How do we take this to the institutions, which is the where they ask the practical questions of what do they have to do now, pragmatically, and, uh, uh, and not deal with sort of the immediate questions of the day, the hot button issues, abortion, LGBTQ, and so on. How can we get them to turn towards an actual discussion of profound ideas and not simply adapt to the popular agenda of the moment? So that's what I have by way of messages from the Ibero-American Youth Movement. Thank you very much. Great, well, let's, uh, well, everyone got a question. So let's, if you could answer those um, in order, Jacques, Megan, Anastasia and Dennis, and then Carolina, I believe uh, Helga has also uh, made herself available. So after we go through those, if you have a question for Helga, maybe we can get to that too. Uh, so uh, Jacques, uh, go right ahead. Uh, I, I can't hear Jacques, can, can others? Still can't hear you, Jacques. <laughs> okay, let's give it a few more seconds and maybe we'll come back. Okay, now I can't hear anybody else either, so I'm not sure if this is Jacques or something broader. I, how about me? Can you hear me? I, I can hear you now. Jacques, try again. Okay, we'll come back to Jacques. Um, let's go ahead to, um, to to Megan now. Okay, sure. I think Carolina, what you said about the work on Kepler saving saving a lot of time or cutting through the the sophistry that people are trained in in not just the universities but really all of education leading up to the university, it's really true. Um, you know, Larouche wrote tremendous amounts on, and spoke. A, a tremendous amount about education, what education actually is. The education is not the memorization of facts. It's not, um, you know, posturing. For me, the the epitome of, of everything I hated about the current education is expressed in the debate team. And I'm sorry if I've offended anybody <laughs> on the debate team, but it's, you know, it doesn't matter if you're right. It just matters if you can convince people that you're right. Um, and, and it's a real tragedy. And as opposed to that, LaRouche always demanded the standard that education is the rediscovery of principle. You don't know something because you read it in a textbook or you were told by a reputable authority. You know something because you discovered or rediscovered for yourself that it was true. Um, so in, in terms of Kepler, he Kepler is one of the most generous scientists that, that I'm aware of in terms of writing out each step in his process of discovery. And that's why it's really wonderful for uh, a self-education of a youth movement to be able to sit down and have Kepler himself walk you through every mistake he made, why he tried this, you know, tangent or this side path, um, which he thought might get him somewhere, except, oh no, it failed. And then he, it, but it made him think of this. So he walks you through everything. Um, the other thing I was thinking when you brought this up is, I think one, another reason that Kepler cuts through this kind of, you know, maybe kind of silly arguments that one might get into on the campuses, which aren't really getting at the substance of the thing, are because if you work with somebody on these ideas, if you can get them to, um, you know, be gripped with that question of, well, how do I know, or, or do I know? that the planets go around the sun and it, 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 rather than the sun going around the earth. Do I know that for myself? Um, do I know that the planets move in ellipses or was I just told that? If you can get somebody to do that and if you can actually sit down with them and work on Kepler or build the platonic solids, um, take that instrument that I share, the picture of that little monochord um, vibrating string and help them generate the scale, the musical scale 
it's fun. It, it's, it's natural for the human mind to take joy in discovery. And I think that's another reason that doing that can help all of these other silly things that people thought they were supposed to think are so important. Um, they, they gladly throw them away for something which is much more fun, much more human, much more truthful. And, and I think that really is um, the essence of recruiting a youth movement of potent political leaders who are educated, self-educated to replicate the most important, not just the specific discoveries and thoughts of those who came before us, but also replicating the mode of creative thinking itself. When you work through the discoveries of Kepler, Gauss, Leibniz, LaRouche, you're practicing in a sense, a, a mode of creative thought. And that really is the most important. And, and, and it's, it's connected to the kind of joy in the soul that Jacques was referencing with the issue of optimism. That's what makes a good political leader. Um, I hope I answered your question. Oh, on the paradoxes. <laughs> yeah, I think, again, I think um, that's why Kepler is so great that he, Kepler really, because he had an artistic mind, because he believed that the universe had to be beautiful and knowable, he had this underlying feeling for when he was pursuing something and ran into something which was merely just a shortcoming in the measurement versus an actual ontological paradox, which was the result of a new principle that he hadn't yet discovered. So I think um, Kepler can be really great for that. So that's what I would say. Thank you, Megan. Let's, uh, let's go to Jacques now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. okay. So, so uh, sorry, sorry for that. that. I, wanted I wanted to start, to start uh, with Fidelio. Uh, the, choice the choice of, of uh, Leonora's, Leonora's aria, aria to start, start I, think, I think, was the was best, best in the best of all possible worlds. worlds. Because, because uh, uh, Leon uh, Fidelio, Fidelio is celebrates, celebrates the love of man and woman, uh, I must say, consubstantial with the love of humanity. And this harmony of love is won, is a victory of freedom, announcing at the end of the opera a political freedom not only for the historical moment where the opera takes place, but for the whole humanity and for the principle of harmony beyond this harmony of the opera. So Beethoven himself said that confronted to his life, he felt at the same time happily and happy and unhappy. Unhappy because uh, what's happening in his times was not good. But he was very happy because he knew that there is something in humanity that his uh, music would resonate with in the future and elevate the human mind of all. So I think about that at this moment of history in a 20th century, and I think this is very important for the students in general, not only in Mexico, but in the whole world, uh, where in the 20th century, there was mainly a step backward in politics and with a really criminal situation that we are reaching today. But there was at the same time advancements in science, I mean Einstein, but I also mean people that are less known, who are Alexander Friedman in Russia, which father was a ballet dancer and the mother a pianist, which is a good combination for a uh, scientist. And then uh, about uh, Georges Lemaitre in Germany. So both of them established that the universe was in expansion. There was a big debate with Einstein. So there was this optimistic uh, conception of that there is a unity in the universe and this unity is in the expansion of the human mind and the expansion of the universe itself, both between resonance. And I think when the young generation 
gets a sense of that beyond the games of images and the destruction of the minds through uh, the combination of seduction, addiction, and then frustration, and then you go back to the same, to the same logics, uh, then if you create that in their minds through the music and through the science together, then they have an optimistic view of the universe and they were inquiring, searching for what's good. And I think if you, uh, like Lin, if you always develop in the mind of the people that are around you, this search for something better, that curiosity for what is coming uh, in a better world, uh, in the best of all possible worlds, then you have with the students the capacity to change and to give a sense of the freedom and its freedom is coherent and coherent intrinsically with the necessity to improve our universe. Hmm. Thank you, Jacques. Let's uh, turn to Anastasia. Hi. Well, I'm really glad to have you on, Carolina. It's a, a good way to actually connect on collaborating more on, uh, on what you guys are doing over in Ibero America. Um, just in terms of what we've been doing with the Leonora, um, some of the responses we've gotten back, emails in from people who have subscribed. Um, I got one not too long ago of, a, of a, an older man who actually printed out portions of the Leonora and gave it to his uh, younger daughter. And he said for the first time in his life, he was finally able to have a real conversation with her. <laughs> uh, and this was about education. This is about how do you educate people? What's the state of the, of, um, well, in particular in the United States, um, the state of education here. And uh, it opened up a, a really wonderful discussion um, that is still ongoing, it seems like. Uh, with him. So he was very excited about that. Uh, in terms of what we're doing uh, with growing with the youth movement, I'm sure you've heard we we had a very wonderful cadre school just a few weeks ago. There was like 12 or 15 youth that were there, actual youth. I mean, I'm 32. I, I can't really say that I'm young anymore. <laughs> but I'm sure others, others would disagree with me. But um, uh, of actual youth. And Helga's really given um, this, this idea of we have to make a breakthrough in ideology. We have to have an ideology project. So a lot of these young guys, um, we've created this uh, online forum where people can start bringing forward uh, their original work, things that they're working on, ideas that they have. Um, like there was, uh, anyway, I, I won't go through some of the specifics. I don't, I don't know if he'd be excited if, if I brought it up because he hasn't quite thought it through all the way, but um, some of the younger guys have already put forward a few ideas and we do have papers that are coming in, which would be coming up in the future Leonora's. Um, but yeah, the idea is to, um, like for instance, uh, some of these these new people coming around are in the Marxic, Marx networks. And so they're thinking about how do I help them through the ideologies that they're fixed in. And there's 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 quite a few, but there's there's uh, some fun ironies that come in because Lyndon LaRouche um, kind of breaks you through some of those things. Um, so anyway, that, that's a few a few things that we've done. Uh, we will be having it's, very late, but we will be having uh, our, our next issue of Leonora coming out soon. Um, you know, we've all been incredibly busy trying to stop World War III, so that's just where it's been. Um, but I would like to collaborate with you more. Um, so uh, whenever is a good time for you to, to, to talk, or um, that would be great. And uh, Dennis. Hmm? Yeah. I, okay, um, uh, to answer my question, the first thing I want to do is show a short video, uh, which is Ramsey Clark and uh, Helga. Go ahead. The purpose can only be seen 
as destroying it's more than a political movement it's more than a political figure it is those two but it's um, a fertile engine of ideas uh, <clears throat> a common purpose of thinking and studying and analyzing to solve problems <clears throat> regardless of the impact <clears throat> on the status quo or on vested interests. It was a deliberate purpose to destroy that at any cost. The most important in history is ideas, especially those ideas which move mankind forward, which are ideas which make the life of generations to come more human. Now, my answer is that the first thing you have to do with anybody that's coming around our movement or wants to take us seriously is make it clear to them we are involved in a revolutionary process. We are about ideas, and that is dangerous to people who are in the status quo. But we are also about ideas because they are the greatest pleasure of humanity. I mean, I think that the difference, the thing that we have to combat, we can call it in different na names, whether it's woke culture or you know, the various uh, multiple sexes and so on, is this idea of utmost pleasure, which is the idea of Locke. Uh, that man tends toward, and the aspiration of mankind is for the utmost pleasure. And what Leibniz said against that, as we quoted, was, I do not know whether the greatest pleasure is possible. I believe, rather, it can grow out infinitum. I believe that happiness is lasting pleasure, which is completely different. And he said, and when you don't have reason, uh, what happens is people tend to what they think are pleasant, present pleasures, but actually those things may be the worst thing for them. Um, the fact that that has become the dominant practice or dominant culture is not accidental because there is, it was an, an ideological and, if you will, phil philosophical intent, which is, goes back hundreds of years, that shaped the present culture that we're in. That, that's what has actually happened. So that the things that people see themselves doing, they think that they chose to do. No, that was all something that got discussed in an intense debate between Locke and Leibniz, which was so intense actually at the time that uh, uh, Leibniz's book was not initially published, although he did try to circulate it and did circulate it as much as possible in England among his faction, which were still, of course, vying for power. But I think that the idea is to really see him. He was a universal mind. Lynn is the next one that you have like that. If you, and people often, you know, would look at Lynn's writings, they all, they're many very political and so forth. Well, how about something like Cold Fusion, Challenge to, Challenge to U.S. Science Policy, in which he wrote back in 1992. He was in jail. If you look at this thing, it takes a summary of where the state of science is, and it poses to the United States as, a, as, an, as an entity, but not to the United States merely, how you can investigate what was the entire frontier of science at the time that Lynn did it, and he did it from jail. One of the things that you find if you're doing intellectual work is that you, quote, run out of steam. That is, you don't have the ability somehow to think clearly or think of the next idea or think in depth. He didn't have a problem. And people who visited him or saw him, I think Joseph McCloskey uh, talked about it, in his uh, uh, tribute to Lynn, there's found, he said, I talked to him for six hours. And he, the, he didn't just know these things, he knew them in depth, or like Nobel Reinen has said about Lynn, the same way. What people are looking for is that pleasure, that area of happiness that only this kind of intellectual pursuit allows one to, to feel or to, or, or to encounter. I mean, Schiller, had it in a different view. And of course, he talked about this idea of the education of the emotions to achieve uh, that kind of idea, that kind of depth. I, I think if we uh, give people this idea, look, this is a battle. And a lot of the battles is, is eternal. It, it, it's the thing that Gandhi said, right? That 
it's my experiments with truth. You know, the thing, people that keep talking to me about this revolution they say I made against the British, well, actually, the thing that was important to me was, you know, what I wasn't doing, and I usually failed in those battles I was fighting against myself. Now, these other things that you're referring to, yes, they're important, but they are secondary to my own experiments with truth, not that the uh, Salt March and the other things weren't, but, and I think that's the way um, that I would say it. And I would ask just if, if Helga, who, uh, you know, knows this uh, better than, certainly than I, and I think all of us, if she has anything to say about the same area of discussion that you've brought up. Do we uh, have Helga available? Helga, would you like to? Great. Oh. Um, <laughs> Car- let me ask you. also, just off first also, uh, yeah. uh, Carolina, do you have anything that you'd like to, to add in your, your, your questions to, uh, to Helga and that we can get her response? Sí. <laughs> Solo esta pregunta como... Yes, just this question. As Dennis was saying, it's it's an internal question to be able to inspire youth. You, one needs to do this by example, I think, or that's what I've seen in any event in our deployments, in the institutions, in the streets, at the universities. And I see how our nations in Ibero-America have been cataloged as underdeveloped ad infinitum. And one of the things which LaRouche gave us to discover that that's not true. And that because we are youth in Ibero-America, we're not condemned to underdevelopment, intellectual underdevelopment, nor moral underdevelopment, nor of the soul, nor of any sort. That's why it's so important to take these ideas to all of those youth so my question for Helga is how do we show that sense of hope that they that sense of hope generally has nothing to do with what people are living through in reality in reality people are experiencing very discouraging situations how do we show them that if which is something they've never seen in Colombia and Chile and Mexico and other countries in Haiti, they've seen, lived through underdevelopment their entire lives. How to give them a sense of that future the way Lynn showed it to us and to provide that sense of hope to the youth so that they can feel that internal sense of strength to fight for a new just economic system. So that's it. Thank you, Helga. Well, my my answer to that would be um, that you should try to um, get more contact with the Asian countries, because you know, looking around in the world right now, I think that's where the momentum is. And I'm not just talking about China; I'm talking about all of Asia. I was so uh, happily reminded when uh, I think it was K. R. Ganesh uh, in this video of the Lin tour around the world was saying, you know, that they are working on the realization of a new world economic order. And that was probably 30 years ago, uh, 30 years or 20 years ago, a long, long time ago. And, you know, now it is happening. Um, I think that the spirit of Bandung is much more alive in Asia than at any other place in the world. Um, Maybe in some African countries as well, but in Asia, I know it for sure. Already two or three years ago, when I was participating in an Asian dialogue of cultures, which was a huge event where all Asian countries were present, the spirit was so different. They they are absolutely convinced that the Asian century is is uh, you know has started, and what they do is they, you know, they have this idea of you know allying naturally with the Belt and Road Initiative the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, ASEAN, uh, but they have this idea of reviving their own classical tradition and 5,000 years of history in in many cases, but with a clear orientation of the future. And I can only say that if I compare the mental outlook of people 
in many Asian countries with the absolute incredible pessimism in Germany, in many European countries, and even in the United States, which has become German in this respect, which is terrible. Um, I would suggest that people in Latin America think much more in terms of focusing on what is happening uh, around Asia, because, you know, I mean, I have found that when you only think in terms of your own country, um, I mean, it's good to be a patriot, but you have to be a world citizen as well. And since right now, I am absolutely convinced that in the next several months, huge events will come from Asia. So, you know, I think it's very good for young people to not be just ling limited to their own country, but to become world citizen, especially in a moment right now where an epoch is ending, a new epoch has already started. There are many countries of the global south who are building a new system. And, you know, I have found, you know, I mean, I joined this mo movement many, many years ago because it was an international movement, because Lynn promised that, you know, that these developing countries had to be developed. And when you are a young person, you have a much bigger sense of injustice than, you know, when you get old and get some sort of accustomed to things. So I would really use this uh, Global South cooperation, naturally, you know, with the La Rouge Shoes movement, which, you know, I think is really, uh, something we have to build much more, much more consciously, but that would be my immediate uh, advice. Hmm. Great, thank you, Helga. Um, before we move on to other questions that have come in, uh, Helga, I'd like to ask if you would like to say anything else just in response to the, the presentation so far? Well, I think this idea of, of a classical renaissance or a renaissance of a classical culture is, is really important. I mean, Lynn wrote at many different uh, places that the society cannot be saved if we don't get the majority of people to think in terms of classical art, beauty, classical composition. And, you know, if you look around in the leadership of the world today, who who in Europe in the leading position has ever spoken in depth about Leibniz, about Schiller, about Humboldt or Beethoven or any of these uh, people? I have not heard any one of them. The last social democrat in Germany who knew anything about the classical period was somebody was, whose name was Carlo Schmidt. And I think he died 40 years ago. It's a, it's a shame, you know, these people are educated by the Frankfurt School, by, you know, the Congress of Cultural Freedom, uh, modernistic music or pop music, you know, the present head of the cultural work in Germany. Uh, she was the manager for a pop band, terrible, horrible pop band. So that's about the level, you know, and I think that, you know, the occupation with with true beauty is really the only thing which forms the character. I mean, and that is intelligible. That's the difference between Schiller and Kant. You know, Schiller had this idea of, about the aesthetic education and that only through the occupation with great art would there be an improvement of the character of people. While Kant said there is no, uh, no, 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 lawfulness in art, uh, an ar arbitrary arabesque somebody throws against the wall is more beautiful than a piece of art where you can recognize the design of the composer. I mean, he was a terrible person. And, you know, this is what is he and Savini, they were responsible for this division between Geisteswissenschaften and Naturwissenschaften, which Lynn so beautifully reunited. So I think that the to get young people to see the beauty, you know, what I have done in the past um, repeatedly was to just take two pieces of music. You know, I took, for example, Marian Anderson singing some very beautiful spiritual or some classical song and play that or, you know, show that and then have some absolutely horrible uh, you know, Lady Gaga or Madonna or uh, what's this um, this uh, young lady who always uh, 
rides on this um, on this ball which rips down buildings. I don't know the English word right now, but you know what I mean. It's very famous. I mean, that's just total ugliness. And people have to get a sense of what is beautiful and what is ugly. And I think it had a method by the oligarchy to, to poison people's minds with ugly things, ugly clothes, ugly paintings, ugly buildings, you know, because it, it, it has a depressing effect. And I think, you know, this, what Jack was talking about, the pessimism, you know, I wrote articles a long time ago that cultural pessimism is a mental disease. It, it is something which should be treated. You know, it's not a healthy state of mind. And so I think the, you know, the occupation with beautiful things and to understand why they are beautiful, why are Renaissance buildings, architecture beautiful, and why are the Houston glass buildings ugly? I mean, that's something one can explain, the golden means. Uh, you can understand the beauty of poetry, the, the form of poetry, the content of poetry. I mean, these are all things which are completely forgotten. And if you compare, for example, the beauty of the letter exchanges among the great Leibniz's letters uh, with Huygens or Schiller with uh, Humboldt or Körner, I mean, there's so many beautiful things. If you compare that to today, you have texts, you know, you have Twitter tweets. You know, that, that is how deep we have sunk. And, and that is why we have to have an absolute revolution against this and fight for, for the beauty. And I think the occupation with the galaxies and the space at large, you know, I think this uh, James Webb telescope is, is really a donation from the heavens, quite literally, because it forces people to think about the questions Megan was talking about. And I think that's the way how we break the idea that people are just earthlings. Mm. Okay. Well, let's let's build on that with a question that came in by email about the James Webb Space Telescope uh, data for Megan. Um, and we have we have several more email questions to go through too. And again, you can send yours in to us at questions at schillerinstitute.org. So Kynan asks. Uh, he says, "Thank you all for your incredible presentations." Much has been discussed on this principle of harmony between, universe, uh, between humanity and the universe. The James Webb Space Telescope has revealed many things about our universe and has unleashed a new set of principles of which we are obligated to discover. The TRAPPIST-1 system, which Megan briefly talked about, illustrates that, but it's incredibly interesting that this system follows the same harmonic ratios as our own planetary system. So many parts of the universe the many galaxies and various stars that we discovered, they seem to follow principles we already know, but there are small differences, as Megan pointed out. Uh, here's questions. Why is it that the creator includes these small differences or dissonances among the various systems of the universe? What does that imply about the nature of the universe? And will these contradictions ever be fully resolved as we uncover more and more knowledge? Well, I can start on that. Uh, take this question of dissonance. You look at, I was, I gave a presentation recently where I used this, so it's in my mind. You look at... De la dissonancia, oh. una. You look at the, um, look at the quartets of Mozart. There's a famous one called the Dissonance Quartet. So I'll reference people to go listen to that. But take any of these quartets of Mozart, of Beethoven, um, take the fugues of Bach. What's the function of dissonance? And, and you have two minds on this. You have the modernist school that Helga was just referencing that says that that, that uses dissonance for dissonance sake. It, it uses dissonance as ugliness, purposeful ugliness. But in real classical composition, that's not how dissonance arises. It's not just a you know, something thrown in to spice it up or, or even worse, if you're talking about um, some other compositions. Dissonance arises as uh, a lawful consequence of the unfolding of the composition. You have these many independent voices, you know, each member of the string quartet with their own, the, their own line is developing in a certain way. And that brings the voices temporarily into dissonance. And 
what that does to the mind is it it forces the mind of the listener to hypothesize the direction of development. Where is the composition going? It it's a, it's a way for the mind to be able to leap ahead to hypothesize the potential resolution of the paradox. And I think that dissonances, um, cracks, paradoxes in the data of you know of the, the universe at large, these kinds of things you're raising, I think that's the function of those. I think that um, they that that um, paradoxes, disagreements, dissonances arise as a way for us to hypothesize and peer into what did we not know? What, what do we not yet know? Which is actually generating these motions or actually generating this phenomenon. And I think in terms of the planetary systems, I mean, it's, it's so funny that we've only studied, really studied one solar system out of trillions and quadrillions of them. Um, but, um, you know, you, you, you look at what the dissonances in these planetary systems or between planetary systems could indicate to us, it, we, we, we do need to make this breakthrough of the larger galactic system. Each of these solar systems, yes, is being controlled by its star, um, the gravitational effect of its star, but that star is possessed by or, or animated by the galactic principle. What is that galactic principle? We still haven't discovered that. What is the intergalactic system principle? And, and that's going to show up in the motions or in, in features of these planets. So I think that's what we have to be looking for in these cracks and these dissonances. Hmm. Thank you, Megan. Uh, so let me now read a couple of questions that I think fit well with many of the talks on this panel. This comes from a combination of thoughts from uh, Bernie and uh, someone else. So uh, let me add, so Jacques, in your presentation, you talked about Carnot and his sense of, of work. Uh, makes me think, you know, the enthusiasm of Louis Pasteur. And you had brought up the question that somebody says, well, can't somebody else do it? You know, what would, what would give a person the confidence to say, I'll do it. I'll be the one um, who does that. Let me read this question from Bernie and put that together. Is the realm of possibility limited only by our imagination? If one accepts that our imagination is boundless, then can one, by contemplating the proposition that there is a boundlessness of possibilities, could we consider that the universe or even an infinite number of universes have existed? Can we regard ourselves as universal entities that are birthless phenomena that merely repeat the cycle of birth and death throughout eternity? Would this challenge the idea of creationism? And he gets a little bit more specific. He asks for the panel's thoughts about Shakespeare's Act Three soliloquy by Hamlet, the to be or not to be uh, soliloquy. He asks whether coming out of this, one can understand that even from the greatest evil can come the greatest good. He quotes Gandhi saying, be the change you want to see. And I think that this question of his about uh, Hamlet goes along with Leibniz's view about the best of all possible worlds. So that's, that's quite a bit to, to put together, um, but I'd like to ask definitely um, Dennis and, and Jacques uh, to, to weigh in on this collection of thoughts that have come in. Um. Jacques, you want to start? Well, uh, I think something that inspired Carnot was to look from a higher standpoint where he was educated, what was bringing down his nation. And within the horrors of the Ancien Regime, or the monarchy, and the horrors of the revolution, he, tries, he tried to find a pathway to <clears throat> break with, in a positive way, with these negative ideologies in his own country. And Lin always told us that we have to face uh, uh, what are the ideologies of our countries which prevent us to step ahead 
and in terms of today, fulfill our mission to save humanity. I was thinking about that, and I <clears throat> said that to Carolina. I was visiting <clears throat> a few weeks ago the house of San Martin, San Martin, the uh, Argentinian prosser, the Argentinian hero in Boulogne. And I was thinking what was lacking to San Martin and Bolivar when they met in uh, Peru, in Callao, what, what happening to them? What was the limitation? And what, in a certain sense, Carnot had of relatively beyond them? And it's not because he was French, but on the contrary, he, it was because he faced the French ideology. And I think that's the first thing to have and to laugh at it. And I think to laugh at the Caudillismo, to laugh at something that I felt in my own youth in, in uh, Argentina, it's a, an important step. It's like the rebellion or the highness laughter. Then you have, uh, of course, uh, Schiller and the upper level of thinking. And then if you are emerged into the connection between science and art, and with the two of them as a one, then you look at Asia, as Elga said, from a different standpoint, and you see in Asia this, I must say, intrinsic optimism today. Optimism in Indonesia, for example. Indonesia is a growing power. You see China, you see the whole region. And if you see that, and you see Ibero-America, and you think that this is, a, you have the same impulse, you can reach that impulse, and it's, your fun to reach that impulse. And then you have overcome the limits and not only you laugh at them, but you do something that makes sure that they will never come back. Uh, yeah, can I be heard? Good, okay, great. Um, yep. Let me just take up one thing. Uh, the largest galaxy that we know of is something called IC1101. I'm gonna put this up on the screen here. Uh, if you compare it to the Milky Way, the Milky Way is something like 100,000 light years in diameter. And this IC1101 uh, is 4 million light years in diameter. It's 40 times the size of the Milky Way. It's about a billion light years from the Milky Way, and it contains 100 trillion stars. Now, uh, this is a shot that just shows the comparison between them. Uh, and if IC1101 were where the Milky Way is, then it would completely cover Andromeda, okay, which is the next galaxy, uh, which is two and a half million light years away. Uh, Confronted with that, I'm not asking a question whether there are multiple universes. If you've got one galaxy with 100 trillion stars, that's enough for me. Uh, I, I don't think that that question, um, I, I, many people often ask this question, it just tends to show the, the inability to face the vastness of what we're really talking about. But then you get these other anomalies. We just want to bring up the Trappist one thing again. We have a, a Megan's uh, a shot from that, uh, and you see here the Trappist one system with the seven planets and the dwarf sun in the middle. As you see, it's a dwarf sun. It's much much cooler than our sun and smaller. Uh, then you see comparatively the Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. Now go to the next one. Now, this is something I wanted to ask Megan about anyway, which is if you see on this shot, and I can't fully read it from where I am, but basically, if you look at the, the orbits of the planets of our solar system, uh, for example, the Earth takes 365 and a quarter days to go around the sun. If you look at the Trappist system, you have these planets going around their sun in one and a half days, two and a half days, four days, and so on. Now, at least when I read this, and I want to see what you have to say about this, Megan, they seem to say that there had been some synchronization between the annual 
uh, annualization, right, so to speak, the year length and the day length on these planets. I don't know if you know much about that, but what's fascinating about that, in other words, is that your whole year is one and a half days. Uh, the, these sorts of anomalies, these sorts of things, the, what, what does this even mean to the mind? I find not only fascinating, but I will put it like this. If, if this were actually what people were caused to think about in terms of what they think of as the possible, and then to realize that their mind is thinking about that, and they're thinking with other people about that. And whether you're standing on a street corner in Harlem or you're someplace in some palace somewhere in Europe, the truth of the matter is that under certain circumstances, the thought processes that you were having among those people, despite wealth, uh, despite station, despite ethnicity, uh, the mind of anyone can be infinitely large or enlarged. And the most important thing is this idea of enlarging it infinitely. That's why you don't have any ultimate pleasure. That's the whole point of what Leibniz was saying. I think what happens is that people, uh, because of the fact that this is a completely, completely different idea of the universe than we think about. You know, there's a, a foolish man named Thomas Kuhn who wrote a book a long time ago called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. But it's really the process of scientific revolutions that's, that's at, in, at issue. You know what that process is? It's people talking at the age of 13 and 14 about these topics rather than the kind of thing that passes for conversation all throughout our society now. I mean, if you're going to tweet, tweet about this. Send these images around. And then what that does is it, it interrupts the banality of the general process. I, I think that's the thing that we want to make sure we are promoting. And I think it's, it's really a lot of fun, by the way, to just encourage people to do that. And this is a good way also to think about the real significance of China and what's happening in the educational system of China and those people that are coming out of poverty uh, or Russia. And, and the Russian Academy of Science, of Science has celebrated its 300th anniversary in two years. We talked about how Leibniz had sat down with Peter the great, at the end of Leibniz's life, uh, and had this conversation with him. He was dead a few months later about how you could reorganize your entire society using this idea of these universities. Just beginning to think about this as being the core of the actual American Revolution, not the, not the jingoist, John Wayne, whatever you want to say that Americans talk about or have been caused to talk about. That wasn't the American Revolution. Lyndon LaRouche was the highest expression of this in, in contemporary time, especially in his grasp of the physical economy idea. And, and the way that he would convey this in all these different programs for all these different countries, right, whether it's India or it's China, whatever, uh, the, the, infinite, the seeming infinite ability of Lynn to just call upon this inside of himself on behalf of other people, is, is that, I think, is, is what our... If we can in some way inspire people to think about this, just realize what was done in the last several decades to prevent them from knowing this, you will see a revolution unlike any we've ever seen in human history, I think. Not merely because it's Lenin LaRouche, but because of the number of people who've been denied this and the number of people that are now aspiring all over the world to change that and change their circumstance. Hey, um, Anastasia, would you like to weigh in before I read another couple of questions? Well, I'm just kind of thinking about the first question that uh, Bernie had brought up about um, are we limited by our realm of possibility simply by our imagination? And, you know, I mean, people are funny because, uh, you know, I, I talk to a lot of artists and I also want to encourage many artists to reach out to me. I'd like to create a network of artists around the world so we can work on these kinds of things together. But it's not that you're, yes, you're limited by your imagination, but you're limited by the principles that bound the universe, which your imagination should also abide by. And uh, this comes up when you're talking about um, composition, because like Helga was bringing up, you know, you got people just throwing things on a canvas and saying, this is art. 
are screeching, you know, do hust and, you know, having satanic rituals and calling this art or whatever they're doing. Um, that doesn't, that's, that's not creativity. That's not what this is. When you're talking about um, making discoveries about principles, making discoveries about these things and then expressing it, you're using your imagination to provoke the minds of other people. And um, that process is understandable by all human beings. And it's, it's actually really, uh, Einstein called it um, understanding God. That's how, how he had described it. So anyway, I thought that was a fun, a fun question, Bernie. All right. Well, let's read a couple more then. Um, this first comes from Chris, and then we'll hear one from Renee. Chris said, uh, Lynn spoke of the principled sameness, the relationship of the microcosm and its seeming opposite, the macrocosm. How can this be reconciled? And then let me also ask this question from Renee. She says, in thinking about the relationship of science and classical art, a centerpiece of that domain is the matter of bel canto singing. Lynn always emphasized how the harmonic relations reflected in Florentine bel canto were a universal characteristic discovered during the Renaissance, and which much later, incorporating the work of Kepler, paved the way for the revolutionary discoveries of Bach. And Bach also benefited as a genius from growing up where Leibniz had influence over the educational system. I take this one step further, she says. The COVID pandemic has had a devastating impact on the morale of the musical community globally, which because of corruption over classical art was not in great shape anyway. The approach of looking at science and classical art may turn out to be the key to not only restoring choruses, orchestras, concerts, etc., but in bringing together the science of human medicine to be the kind of Renaissance study that it was for the Islamic Renaissance thinker, Ibn Sina. We need a concept of this to salvage the great musical achievements of the morally wounded transatlantic world and the bridges to a human relation to the rest of the world. In other words, she asks, by including the biological sciences in this interaction of science and art, can we touch directly on what could and should be done on matters of defending the human species medically? So it's open to whoever would like to take on these thoughts from Chris and from Renee. Who's first? I guess I'll start. I don't, in terms of Chris's question, um, I mean, I would just refer Chris to some of Lynn's um, more recent writings where he talked about, he called them the triads. So he talked about the first triad and somebody should help me remember, um, which was Brunelleschi, Cusa, Ke uh, Cusa, Brunelleschi and Kepler, I think. And then the next more modern triad, it was Planck, Einstein and Vernadsky. So you had Planck's work in the very small with the quantum, um, seeming, the seemingly small, you know, smallest thing in existence. What Einstein showed us about with his theory of relativity another work about the universe as a whole at large. And then, but, but in both of those, you have these paradoxes, these commas. And what LaRouche said is to resolve that, you have to go to a higher principle that can um, kind of reorder our thinking about both of those things. And he pointed to the work of Vernadsky on life and cognition, that life and cognition are actually the principles which are shaping the development of the universe. They're, they're higher than non-living abiotic physics. And so if you want to resolve the paradoxes and contradictions which seem to exist between the very large and the very small, you have to go to that higher generating principle that you weren't including before. Well, let me uh, just Jacques. add one thought. Oh, sorry. Yes, uh, there is a, a known saying by Blaise Pascal, a French philosopher and theologian, the eternal silence of the infinite spaces scares me. So people quote that as something in itself. It's absolutely not. What Pascal says is a thinking of a libertine, 
is a thinking of a cynical pessimist. As for myself, when I locate in my mind the capacity to resonate with this universe, I know that there is a creative principle and I feel happy about it. And the more I don't know on what it is, the more I can't reach it, the more I think that there has to be a composer and a composition to this universe. And it challenges me to know more and more. This was expressed in another way at the end of his life by Nicolas, Nicolas Cusa. He says that there is a power in itself, as he called posse ipsum, and you can never have this power, but what you can do is you can always search for it, and in the searching, you find things about your universe, and these things makes you think of further things that you would never know, but you are happy that they are in this universe because it gives a sense that you are part of it and part of this generating principle. Helga, would you like to go ahead? Well, I just want to say that for Nicolas of Kuss, um, the macrocosm and the microcosm was governed by the same lawfulness. And there is actually a very simple proof of that. Um, and that is that the idea which is generated by the human mind, um, the human mind being the microcosm, uh, this idea is immaterial. It doesn't weigh anything. It has no extension. But if it's an efficient idea and leads to a change in the physical laws of the universe, it changes the physical law of the universe. And obviously, it can only do that if there is a corresponding in the lawfulness. I think this is a very simple but profound thought. <clears throat> and in a certain sense, Leibniz had the same conception with the monade, the monade <clears throat> being a reflection of the entire lawfulness of the universe. So I think that that is um, you know, <clears throat> the idea that both are developing in an unlimited neck entropic way, that there is no limit to the self-perfection of the human mind. And by the same idea, the universe is uh, developing in an anti-entropic, infinite way. Um, so that's a very fascinating thought. To say, um, this was a way of actually having conversation about this, that uh, the idea also that the monad is simple, a simple substance, and that it cannot be destroyed. Um, it comes into existence as a whole and go out, out of existence as a whole, so to speak, but it, it cannot be destroyed. Uh, it's an interesting, very important idea. Uh, you know, the, it, <clears throat> one of the most important things, of course, is that these are theologically based ideas. Um, and, and when you're thinking about these, and, and thinking about how these were understood. You know, Lynn wrote a piece called The Science of the Human Mind, where he was re reflecting on Dante Alighieri, the poet, and that the three uh, sections of Dante's poem, uh, each composed of 33 cantos, hell, purgatory, and paradise, each one of them has a system and a geometry. But when you reach the, the Paradiso, what it's defined by is not merely the concentric spheres of heaven that you can see in various illustrations. People try to claim they're Ptolemaic. Actually, I don't think so. I think that Dante's conception of geometry, first of all, it's the ensemble of the three. It's not just take each one as you choose because it's one poem. He's the poet. He's writing it. But there's another element, which is that the way he moves through paradise is this dialogue with Beatrice. Uh, a dialogue he was unable to have with Virgil, although Virgil led him through both hell and into the, period, the earthly paradise um, sections of, of, of purgatory. And uh, the reason I think these ideas are really important to, to consider is when you look at something like the Brunelleschi Dome and you recognize that this is, takes not only years to make and compose, but it, it was something that was anticipated 
It was finished, but it was at 1436, I think. But it was anticipated by 1290 or 1295, and the first architect that worked on it, Arnulfo di Cambio, who created uh, the, 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 the church, uh, uh, San Maria del Fiore Church, uh, knew that someone would, serve, would, would solve the problem of how to put a cupola on top of this. It was, it, it was, it was a great problem that he left to be solved, but he had every confidence that the mind that would come would solve it. So he was in dialogue with a mind that he could never know, but whose nature he knew before it existed. And I think that these are the, the, these, these ideas and getting into this kind of a discussion at this time with people as they are plunged into the most moronic kind of, uh, I loved, by the way, Jacques, your image of the clowns in the slaughterhouse. I cannot get that image out of my mind. Uh, I want to thank you for that image. It's, it's a great one because it's, it's, a, it's very helpful in just allowing us to see the difference between these minds we're talking about, the time we seem to be in, but also the fact that this can be changed by us, you know, as, as Paul said, in, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Because when you look at China, Russia, you look at, as was said already, Asia, Africa, and you look at people in, the, in these, our own countries that want to do something different, it's clear that the p- potential to do that is there, as Leibniz said. This is the best of all possible worlds. And so the issue is making that possible reality. I, I think this is, uh, you know, this whole idea of, of, of that's how you, where you get mental health. That's the way we're going to establish the ability to become sane again. Hmm. All right, let me uh, pose a a question that came in for you, Helga, from Cedric. He says uh, about Asian culture. He says, what Helga says about Asian optimism is very true, but the mass culture of K-pop, mangas, anime, video games from South Korea and Japan is flooding our youth in the West. How do we outflank that? Well, I think concerning Asian culture, um, I agree that the Pokemon also came from Asia. I, I forgot Japan, maybe, or South Korea. Um, and Pokemon, I, I think, was the get, in, get into drug for the vi- violent video games. And um, so I agree. But, you know, that is not really um, Asian culture. I think Asian culture, I mean, have you ever seen the beauty of Chinese calligraphy, Chinese paintings, uh, literati painting where uh, painting, poetry and calligraphy are in one. And in order to understand the meaning of the piece of art, you have to know all three of them because you know it is the metaphor residing out of the three together or you know take the beauty of uh, Asian poetry, um, the wisdom of I mean, I, you know, I, I, I made a speech, I think, 20 years ago, why Americans should go there, talking to the uh, ancient Silk Road. And I think, you know, people should really travel. I mean, I know now with COVID, it's uh, almost impossible. But, you know, if you go to Thailand, to India, uh, to uh, Yemen, to Syria, to... Um, Malaysia, uh, just any country, and you start to look at the the cultures, which are all very, very different. But you, you, you realize that you are discovering entire different universes. And I think the problem is that, you know, if you travel around now in some German cities or some American cities, you have one strip mall, then you go to the next town, you have the same strip mall, Kentucky Fried Chicken, um, the next uh, truck store, and they're all the same. And I think, you know, that is why I discussed with James Bevel, who I once took to my hometown, Trier, um, and he got completely silent. And so I asked him, why are you not speaking anymore? And he said, well, I go back and talk to 
the mayor of Washington, and we have to build new cities which are using beautiful architecture. And I think that that is really why, you know, people have to, I mean, okay, if you want to talk about it in religious terms, there must be a reason why God has created different cultures. Or, you know, if you're not religious, you can say, why is the universe composed in such a ways that different cultures emerge? Um, I think it's the unity in diverse or the diversity in unity and the absolute richness of human creativity to the, to to uh, I mean if you go to architecture in in India uh, even if these were Maharaja um, palaces they are using this architecture now to build modern mayor house uh, city council house and it's beautiful. I think there is a reason why the human mind is capable of producing so many different beautiful things. However, if they are on a classical standard, they are united by universal principles. And I think that that is what makes you rich. How boring it would be if you only have one culture, one one made, ready-made shirt, fit for all. You know, I mean, I think people have to have the experience of this, go to Italy. I mean, Italy has 85% of all uh, cultural goods classified by UNESCO uh, to be that. 85% in Italy alone. Do you know any of those? Well, maybe some. Anyway, all I'm saying is the human, the human species has produced so beautiful things, but they are so different. And you only recognize, you know, the richness when you know at least a good portion of them. So I can only, you can go to a museum, you can virtually now visit uh, exhibitions. I mean, there are so many ways how you can enter that and develop a curiosity about other cultures. I think this is the most healthy thing you can do, you know, not to get stuck in your one, one, Jimmy, one note or whatever this expression is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, Jacques. I, actually, let me, let me just add one one yes. clarification that Cedric added on the chat. It's hard to get things across on YouTube. Cedric just says, to be more concrete, he deals with many young people who are deep in that culture that he had mentioned, and most of them are faced with depression or suicidal ideas. And he's coming at this not from dissing Asian culture, but from working with young people who are affected by this. Go, go ahead, Jacques. Yeah, yeah, but that's what I'm but that's what I try to say. He should introduce them to the beautiful side and not to manga and these kinds of things in order to get the, the difference across. Hmm. He, he Jack, also uh, just like the mangas because they are so ridiculous and so repetitive. So, <clears throat> no, what I wanted to, to add is that Jean Baudin in his six books of the Republic says that the true uh, this was in the middle of the French religious wars. He says that the true uh, state, statesman, statesman uh, the true statesman in his case, <clears throat> has to compose the harmony of the dissonances. So he meant that if there were, were not dissonances, the universe would be a frozen universe of Aristotle's and there would be no creation. And if the dissonances prevail, over everything that would destroy the universe. So the composer, the political composer, should be inspired by the musicians and compose a political uh, a, a society, a political society, where he would make these dissonances coincide at a higher level and create the music of the state. So I think it's a very beautiful way to make the connection between art, music, and also science, because what he said is that if you don't develop agriculture at the time, manufacture, uh, you can't be believed, you can't be followed. Hmm. Okay. Uh, in view of the time and the participation of two of our esteemed panelists from European time, I think we, we're going to move towards concluding remarks and, and wrapping up. So we're going to come back through everybody one more time for your thoughts. And we will start with Anastasia. 
Hi, I was just thinking about a few of the um, the questions that have come up and also to some of the stuff we run into in general about the problem with the youth culture. Because um, I think this issue with depression and suicidal thoughts is, is very prevalent. I mean, there's there's been official studies that have come out that say, you know, 25% of youth have some kind of psychological trauma, uh, uh, trauma or problems like depression. I honestly feel that it's a lot more than that. Um, <clears throat> and looking at, you know, just the intention of what you you see in, in popular culture, just looking at manga, for instance, um, they are actually trying to make you crazy by creating these repetitive, um, these repetitive thoughts, this, you know, you have to try your hardest. And I mean, I used to watch some of this stuff, honestly, when I was a kid, because it was very popular. Pokemon was very popular. Um, but it's just this like triumph of the of the will of the of the greatest and this kind of thing. And we really have got it you know, get out of this brainwashing. That, that's really what this culture has been, has been a, a brainwashing operation to create cognitive dissonance and prevent you from being able to think. And how do we do that? We do that through this classical composition. We do that through uh, working on classical art, classical music, um, and this uh, cl classical science, working on science. Um, I really want everybody here to, you know, to pick up something, pick up a, a, a project, um, whether it's a, a paper from Schiller, uh, something that you know, Megan was bringing up with Kepler, uh, looking at the harmonies, uh, just pick up something and make it your mission this week to, uh, to figure it out and then try to present it to somebody else. And I can really, I can guarantee you that you're gonna feel so much better <laughs> by the end of the week uh, just given all the stuff that comes at you, but you'll you'll really notice the difference. So uh, I'd like to to leave it at that. Hmm. Uh, Megan, sure. Just one before I get to my concluding thought. Just one comment, um, Jacques. I don't know if you know, but Kepler read Jean de Bo Jean Baudin, and he actually quotes him in his Harmony of the Worlds in Book Three on music too try to get across what what is this universal principle of harmony and, and how could we, I just think it speaks to Kepler's quality of mind and what he saw himself, um, the effect he wanted to have on society as a whole, that we can bring this principle of harmony into social relations, into government, into society. So bit of a side comment, but I just, I don't really have much to say by way of a concluding statement. I just want to encourage everybody to read LaRouche. He's, LaRouche is the most profound thinker on the subject of many topics, but specifically the human mind. What is human creativity? Um, I think Lynn, through his own creative thought, but also through his great friendship with some of these incredible thinkers throughout history, Leibniz, Gauss, Riemann, so many others, so many others. I think Lynn uh, was able to develop the most advanced notion of what the creative principle in this universe is. So I wanna encourage everybody to, to read LaRouche, go to the LaRouche library, um, get the, the volumes of Lynn's collected works and begin digging in and studying these things. Okay, and then let's, uh, for the final three here, let's go to Jacques, uh, Dennis, and Helga. So Jacques, go ahead. I mentioned uh, a poem from Lazare Carnot he was not one of the best French poets. And since the 17th century, there are very few French poets that are half good. But it was, and it is, it was, and it is, the intention of Carnot that is, has to be seen as, as, as something really useful in his times. Uh, that would, he was thinking how with the means he had to create this blossoming of great souls, not for themselves, but for the common good, the common good of all. So uh, I think that all of us, and in particular, when you are young and you are, you feel like you, 
<coughs> you, you, you have to be creative. <coughs> Write poems, even if they are not perfect ones, as Carnot wrote in the shadow of Schiller, Keats, or others. Shakespeare. You can write in that way and mustering your inner drive to break through uh, the ugliness of society which has imposed, which is imposed upon you. <clears throat> and it would unleash in yourself some unexpected things, much, much more than you would expect at the beginning. And at the end, you would discover what LaRouche's call laughter, music, and creativity. I'm next? Okay. Well, you're next. Okay. I've been here sitting here trying to figure something out. Now, according to what I figure out, if you could solve the problem of traveling at the speed of light, let's be more ambitious and say you could go 50 light years an hour. If you did that over 24 hours, that's 1,200 light years a day, 438,000 light years a year. Now, we're trying to get to IC 1101, which is a billion light years away. And if my calculations are right, we can do that in 245 years, traveling at 50 light years uh, an hour. Uh, this seems to illustrate that whatever we think about the limitations of the universe, we have a lot of work to do before we can explore much of it. Um, and I wanna, having said that, put that to the side and try to say something here about the, uh, the true revolution uh, that Leibniz and his friends and his ancestors uh, and descendants uh, really talk about in terms of this being the best of all possible worlds. I mean, we can sit here and actually discuss something like this, despite the fact that clearly none of us are going to see anything like uh, the kind of revolution that would allow us to actually ever visit these places. Yeah, but except they're in our mind. And that is the amazing fact about the human mind, which is not the brain. That's something to tell to several of the people who are out here these days as the major scientific thinkers of our time. Um, but, but there's a, a level in terms of the, Amer of the revolutionary process that uh, I just wanted to reference because Helga wrote a, a piece, I think it was in 1980, actually she delivered this speech uh, on the idea of Gandhi's vision for a new world paradigm um, and the idea of the world health program and the notion of direct nonviolent direct action. Uh, and, and, and the idea that what Gandhi, what Dr. Martin Luther King and others were doing was taking something that had happened, which was successful with the American Revolution, and raising it to an entirely different level. Because the problem, of course, in the American Revolution or many of the other revolutions that came subsequently is bloodshed. The problem is that they, had to be, they were violent. Uh, the defense of humanity in the days of the Second World War was necessary. 100 million people died in the course of it. There's a better way to do things. Uh, and what has been proposed by the Schiller Institute and which Helga initiated uh, through the series set of conferences, including this one, was that we force a deliberative process among all of humanity um, to resolve this problem of the most fundamental, far-reaching changes in our planet's history without violence. Now, although, of course, people might think it's more possible to get to IC-1101 than to solve that problem, it would seem to really not be as daunting. And, and I think uh, it's a different order problem in one sense, but it could be the case that we could decide to work together as a human race to do this because there's so much that has been done by so many uh, to bring us to this point 
And it seems to me that anybody who's young, uh, hearing what we're talking about here today, can, would just, could become excited about the prospect that maybe you are the person that like Mandela, like Gandhi, like King, changed the world in ways that are, are, are permanent. Um, and, and, and that's what this movement is about. That's what we mean by the idea of, of revolution and, and change. All right, so turn to Helga Zeplerouf, Schiller Institute founder, to round out the panel. Well, first of all, I want to endorse some of the requests of the previous speakers. Uh, read Lynn a lot. It's uh, very, very important for your soul and your mind. Then write poems, absolutely important because it forces your mind to not think in terms of prose, not to, to, you can't be, if you write a good poem, you can't be deductive or, you know, too flat, uh, flat earth kind of thinking. You have to think in terms of metaphor, otherwise it's not a good poem. Then <clears throat> lastly, I was recently at a space conference and I had some really wonderful discussions with some of the uh, organizers um, and they had one big concern. They said, we have to get across to people about space. We have to go out there because once you are out there, everything will have a different perspective. And actually, our great friend, the German-American rocket scientist, Kraft Erika, with his notion of the extraterrestrial imperative, had the same idea that once man is in space, the identity of the human species changes towards reason you can't get you can't have a freak out and, and leave a spaceship you know you're not going to get very far so you have to be reasonable and and rational and i think this idea of woman on mars you know lynn always had this idea that the space travel and the you know building cities on other planets was absolutely the next step in the evolution and that is really you know, in terms of the uh, time one needs to get to this uh, other galaxy uh, Dennis was speaking about, it's sort of like uh, the person who started to build the uh, church, the cathedral in Florence, not knowing how the cupola would be put together with the catenary uh, approach, but, you know, building it in the confidence that this would happen. And in the same way, we have to now make sure that the human species will be the immortal species by surviving, you know, when the sun goes uh, in, in a turmoil and we cannot really live on Earth anymore. We better have colonies on other stars and other planets. Um, so we have to be confident that we will solve a lot of these problems because it is in the human nature uh, to, to be uh, creative. And finally, you know, to bring it back on Earth, um, I think we are in a very exciting period because these countries of the non-aligned movement who are now on the march, and again, I can only encourage you to follow that very closely because this is right now where the revolutionary momentum is taking place. They are determined to end colonialism forever. And I think that that is really the unfulfilled promise of the American revolution. And the more people we can get to understand that the developing countries have all the rights we have, you know, that to end colonialism in its modern form, you know, and do that with the spirit of Mahatma Gandhi, with the spirit of nonviolence. Um, and this is not just not using, uh, not force or not being not violent, but it means, you know, to get your mind pure. I mean, Gandhi had a whole bunch of efforts and exercises how he would make sure that not even a slightest violent thought would enter your mind. And I think that that is something, you know, you should take your mind as serious as the food you eat or more important. And the more you start to work on your own identity in this way, the more you will approach Nicolaus of Kuz, 
who talked about the sweetness of truth. Uh, and he said, once you discover the sweetness of truth, it will be more sweet than any food, any beautiful thing you can imagine to eat or drink, because the sweetness of truth is the highest sweetness you can accomplish. So I think there is a lot to be conquered and uh, all the reason for optimism. And I think if you know somebody who is depressed, you know, your colleague or your friend, take him by the hand and show him what is there. And when you do something for another human being like that, it makes your own soul healthy as well. So in this spirit, let's build a revolutionary movement to make a better world. Hmm. I'll get Sepp LaRouche, Dennis Speed, Megan Debrot, Jacques Cheminade, Anastasia Battle. Thank you all. Thank everyone who joined us on this two-day Schiller Institute conference, which is uh, coming on a week of major activities, recollections, celebrations, and initiatives of the LaRouche movement, and uh, look forward to our work together. So thank you all. <laughs>